All right, so the license to kill. Now, this all emerged when I asked myself one of those childish toddler questions that I've been encouraging you to ask recently, which was, would a real James Bond, a real operative in the British Secret Intelligence Service, or MI6 as it's sometimes known, have a license to kill as the, the James Bond movies would have us think? And when I asked myself that childlike, but I think quite interesting question, it led me down all sorts of other avenues thinking about, well, when and how does law sanction murder in a democracy such as the UK or the United States or other liberal democracies? How is it that the law can actually give somebody a license to kill? In countries like the UK, we don't any longer have the death penalty, but we do have individuals that are licensed to murder. And it's interesting to find out how they can operate in a lawful manner with such extraordinary power and have the ca capability of performing what could be described as extrajudicial killing. In other words, killing that hasn't been preceded by a court trial, as would be typical in a capital crime or a, a death penalty case. OK, so let's let's dive in with some sort of background and concepts, first of all. Um, and I'm going to have to put on my tinted glasses because I'm half blind. Um, so let's have a think about the concept of a lawful killing, because it's actually really fascinating. If you think about systems of law and the, his and the history of laws, it raises various questions about, well, what is law for? The very earliest forms of law can date back to things like the Code of Hammurabi in, in Mesopotamia, in modern day Iraq. Uh, and much more recently than that, you can look to the 12 uh, tablets of the Roman Empire. And Roman law is one of the foundation pillars of contemporary civil law, which is operated around the world. And then more recently, there was the English common law that developed over a long period of time, but it's quite often dated back to the reign of King Henry II. So there are lots of sources of law, but one of the things that the earliest sources of law had in common was that they sanctioned powerful individuals to utilise their power. <laughs> uh, for example, the Code of Hammurabi, one of the earliest, if not the earliest, um, surviving law books that we have in, in human civilization, is a prime example of what is technically described as lex talionis. Now that means, in simple terms, an eye for an eye. So it's very sort of Old Testament in its approach to crime and punishment. In other words, if a crime is committed, the state, the government authority, has the, the power to, to kill someone for that. So lawful killing was a pretty common occurrence in those days uh, because the state was almost entirely bound up in questions of security. And the earliest forms of states that we see in the world grew up in trying to secure a patch of territory. And so the, the notion that a state would have a right to kill wouldn't really even be questioned. It would be fairly, it would be almost obvious. In fact, it's so obvious that it was often not even written down. And so quite a lot of what we have with regards to the power for states to kill their citizens and non-citizens is bound up in what's sometimes called prerogatives. So for example, in, in early English law, there wasn't there weren't many sort of particular pieces of legislation, nor many court rulings about how specifically the the king uh, or his his government could s sentence somebody to death. Um, and so quite a lot of it was just done on the assumption that, well, the king has a right to do that. He's in charge of this territory. He has a right to kill individuals. There's a really fascinating case when King Charles I was himself put to, to death. The, the treason. And he is tr he was tried by a jury. Now, the jury were people that lived around Whitehall, where Charles I was beheaded. And of course, a, in jury trials, the assumption is that it is a jury of your peers that make the determination of whether or not you should live or die. And Charles I, I guess not entirely unreasonable, said, these people ain't my peers. <laughs> Nobody is my peer except for 
God Almighty. But that didn't spare him. Uh, and he was, of course, famously put to death. So there's this really interesting concept of how can you legitimately kill someone? Uh, how can the state have that right? And why would it do that? What would be the advantage of taking a life as opposed to another form of sanction, such as imprisonment uh, or um, uh, exile or something else? Why kill them? It's it's not as straightforward as as we might imagine. And it has a lot to do with how we even conceive of what the state is for. If we think of the state and, and our government as primarily just keeping us safe and secure, then we can sometimes forgive almost anything done in that name. And especially under, under circumstances of extraordinary threat. During war times, for example, people tend not to be too squeamish about what the state gets up to because it needs to prosecute that war. But in other uh, context, we may have the luxury, the privilege even, to think on the state as more of a of a uh, an of a of an avuncular force. In other words, something that's helping us, that's trying to ch to um, allow us to grow as citizens. And so the notion that it could kill its citizens seems almost repugnant. And certainly to 21st century British people, the idea that there would be state sanctioned murder may be quite surprising because of course we don't have the death penalty anymore. Anyway, so this brings up a whole host of different concepts of law. Uh, you may be familiar of, with things such as positive law versus natural law. This is not a straightforward distinction to make, but positive law is basically laws that are written down. Laws that say in black and white, you can kill someone. Natural law is more of a sense of justice that is born out of a very sort of complex mix of social culture, religion, ideology, geopolitics, uh, and all sorts of other things. It's not natural in the sense that it comes to us from nature, although it can be informed by our sort of natural surroundings. It's more natural in the sense that it's just not written down and it's somewhat more customary. Hence why quite often in, in early states, it wasn't really necessary to write down that the monarch, the ruler, the dictator, whatever, had the right to kill citizens because that would have been considered basically a natural extension of their will. You know, so why bother writing it down? Why bother creating positive law for this? Because it's so obvious, uh, would have been the thinking. And courts and other parts of the state would have had very little oversight. So if the king decided that he wanted to put to death certain enemies of the state, it would be quite difficult for a court to stop that uh, and to review that in, in a judicial context. And so courts basically lacked jurisdiction, we would say. Now, jurisdiction in itself is a really fascinating word because it etymologically means the, the ability to speak the law. Hence, diction. Diction as in, you know, your ability to speak clearly. Jurisdiction is the capacity to speak the law. So courts are the mouthpiece of the law, it's sometimes said. But in regards to state sanctioned murder, for a long time, courts had no jurisdiction. They had no capacity to speak the law. The law, therefore, was a little bit murky, a little bit indeterminate. The kings, the rulers and so forth had these powers, but they weren't very well defined. And that, of course, raises all sorts of potential harms and risks to citizens that they will be murdered arbitrarily at the whim of some sort of uh, tink pot dictator or what have you. OK. There are nonetheless some interesting early examples of uh, kings in England beginning to regulate matters of matters to do with killing. Uh, one example is Richard II, who gets a bit of a bad rap from William Shakespeare, although Richard II is one of my favourite Shakespeare plays. So if you've got a chance to read it, do check it out. But anyway, he's he's not very well. Uh, covered by Shakespeare, but he did interestingly come up with an early ordinance for the government of the army, uh, which in contained all sorts of rules about how in times of conflict, the army was to deport itself. It was, for example, not allowed to, uh, to harm women and children. Now, typically in, in sort of pre-industrial conflicts, there was no qualms against some of the most brutal and barbaric acts you can imagine, not only against soldiers, but also against civilians, uh, and even against the capacity for those civilizations to reemerge. 
infamously and perhaps apocryphally, the Roman legions salted the earth of Carthage, not only so that those generations would all be dead, but future generations would fail to settle as well. So the sheer sort of depth of depravity of, of early warfare is is incomprehensible to modern uh, sensibilities. So Richard II was interestingly ahead of his time, no doubt inspired in part by religion and various other sort of sources of ideology to stop this protection. And that's an interesting sort of step forward in human culture uh, that we have some evidence for in medieval England here. And obviously Richard wasn't the only person pioneering in this in this way, but we get a sense that creeping into this notion of taking territory and controlling resources is also a sense of propriety, also a sense that there are certain things that you ought not to do if you are to be an enlightened ruler. And that is bound up with religion and other forms of ideology. Um, but it's interesting just how much it's developed since industrialization. And I'll explain some of the reasons why that is. And you're probably familiar with a much more sort of recent development from about the mid 19th century up to the present day. War and other forms of state sanctioned murder are much more regulated than they ever were in the past. Uh, possibly the dawning of the modern era of this was the foundation of the first Geneva Convention in 1864. And I'll go into a bit more detail on that. That of course is an international law whereas what King Richard was doing was a domestic uh, law. Um, there are also the Hague rules, and these days we're perhaps more familiar with the International Criminal Court in the Hague, which deals with war crimes, amongst other things. Uh, there were further conventions added um, to, the, to the Geneva uh, Treaties in 1949 in the aftermath of the Second World War, and it's been ongoing. So the most recent contribution is the Ottawa Convention, which is on the use of landmines in warfare. Um, so the laws of war are a lot more elaborate today than they used to be and it's just interesting how quickly that pace seems to have developed in terms of regulating war it's famously said that all is fair in love and war but actually war is a lot more regulated than love these days okay so let's think about some specific categories of state sanctioned murder now probably the most familiar are death penalties so these being punishments that are described and associated with crimes and can be administered usually after a court trial. Certainly in a democracy it would be after a court trial, but in some other countries death penalties can be extrajudicial, meaning that there's no trial required, that someone could be uh, put to death on, on the merest of pretexts. Now in the UK the death penalty was abolished in 1965. Now I should say actually Technically, it was in Great Britain, not the whole UK. Northern Ireland didn't abolish the, the death penalty at the same time, but it has, of course, subsequently been abolished. Um, and so you can see here the legislation that achieved that. Um, and it states that uh, no person shall suffer death for murder and a person convicted of murder shall, subject to subsection five below, be sentenced to imprisonment for life. There were supposedly some caveats to that. Um, for example, high treason was supposedly still a capital crime even after this, but the Human Rights Act of 1998 has just squashed all of those possibilities. So there is no circumstance under which someone can be uh, put to death after a court trial in the UK. But of course, that doesn't mean that state sanctioned murder doesn't happen in the UK, nor indeed that government orchestrated murder doesn't happen overseas as well. Uh, in conflict areas. So, you know, just because the UK doesn't have a death penalty doesn't mean it, it doesn't put its citizens and others to death. Okay, um, the US is probably a more well known example of a contemporary use of the death penalty in a democracy. It's in fact a very rare example of a democracy that continues to use the death penalty, albeit it doesn't actually put to death many of its citizens and the, and the pace of execution varies quite significantly from place to place within the United States. So certain states in America that utilize the death penalty use it far less frequently than others. For example, if you are a, a member of a Los Angeles gang and you're on death row in California, you are uh, going to enjoy a longer life expectancy than your fellow gang members outside on the streets. So not only 
is the process of actually putting someone to death very long uh, and convoluted because of all of the legal steps that have to be taken. Uh, it's also not done with much sort of gleefulness. You know, it's not as if there's a sort of slathering bloodlust amongst American politicians, albeit sometimes that's the impression given. Um, the federal government can put people to death as well, but that tends to vary depending on who the commander in chief is. So Donald Trump uh, was somewhat more uh, enthusiastic about uh, executions, the Obama administration somewhat less so. So it varies a little bit from, from president to president. Anyway, there's some interesting case law. So this is an example of where the courts have developed jurisdiction over death penalty cases. So one case in particular stands out, which is called Furman versus Georgia, which is the United States Supreme Court in 1972. And it had basically banned executions and no one was killed for about 10 years. Was, uh, um, the rationale was that putting people to death was in breach of the Eighth Amendment to the US Constitution, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishments. And the way the courts described the death penalty as it was then operating in the US is that it was unusual. And what they meant by that is that the sort of people that were likely to be put to death were poor, lesser educated and most often African-American as well. So it wasn't a usual punishment. It was a targeted punishment at particular members of society. And so definitionally, it was unusual to put someone to death for a particular crime. What a lot of the states realized was that they could get around this court ruling if they just made the death penalty mandatory. So they meant so it meant that there was no way of getting out of it. So a lot of the states changed their laws such that certain crimes would automatically obtain the death penalty upon conviction. And that would stop it being unusual. And that's precisely what happened. And so there was this stay on executions in the US for a long time. Uh, and there was this sense of, well, the Supreme Court could snuff it out completely. They could still so overrule one of these other state laws and say, well, actually, we still think that putting citizens to death is cruel and unusual and therefore it's unconstitutional. Um, but they demurred from that possibility in the 1976 case of um, Greg versus Georgia. Um, and it's a fascinating case because it pertains to several defendants, but one particularly interesting one is a man called Gary Mark Gilmore, who wanted to be killed which is of course incredibly strange. For the most part, individuals that appeal to the US Supreme Court, of course, are trying to avoid the death penalty and are trying all sorts of legal uh, approaches to, to obtain that outcome. But Gilmore wanted to die and he wanted specifically to be killed for two murders that he had been accused of in the state of Utah. Um, and ultimately he got his wish and he was shot by firing squad shortly after the ruling, uh, being, making him the first person to be put to death after um, the, the case of Furman versus Georgia. Um, and death penalty case law has continued in the US because, of course, having not gotten rid of the death penalty, the Supreme Court has therefore had to deal with a lot of case law around it. They receive a lot of what are called uh, petitions for certiorari uh, every year from death row inmates who are trying to stall the process of their, of their um, execution. Um, and an example relatively recent is called Glossip versus Gross, uh, which was from 2015. And this pertained to the method of execution used. And what the Supreme Court justices ruled was that the, the defendant had to prove that there was a less painful method that could be used by the state for its executions. So that the onus, the burden of proof was on the individual to be executed, not on the state. And they had to prove that there was a less painful method. So. Um, it's all pretty grim stuff, but that's uh, a little bit of an overview of the case law in the US. It's worth noting that not all states of America execute uh, their uh, execute people, um, but it does still happen. OK, so besides death penalty, what other forms of state sanctioned murder are there? Uh, well, of course, there are the armed forces, and this is perhaps another fairly obvious way in which the state will license its operatives to kill people. But as already glossed over, there are some pretty strict laws of war these days. So gone are the days of sort of, um, you know, hordes of barbarians raping and pillaging, at least in theory, um, although sadly, of course, war crimes do continue to occur. Um, 
so where did this all come from, this notion of not only a change in norms, in other words, a change in in ideas about what should happen in warfare, but also positive laws, black black and white written laws about the conduct of armed forces in war. It's a really fascinating story to think about. And it, it reminds us that, you know, actually only relatively recently did governments care about the people that died on their behalf. This is the tomb of the unknown soldier in Westminster Abbey. It was a uh, place that a, a soldier without a name who was unknown was buried here in, on the 11th of November 1920 for his services to the country and to represent all of the other thousands and thousands of dead unknown soldiers who were not remembered. And this would never have happened 100 years previously. So it was famously commented with some sort of, um, you know, uh, difficulty that during the Napoleonic Wars, the battlefields would have been swept for teeth and bones so that they could be ground into fertilizer. There was no sense of respect for the dead soldiers as there would be today. Today, governments take extraordinary care to know who's died, to honor them in an appropriate manner, ideally to bring their remains back to the country so that they can be buried with respect. But this is an astonishingly modern way of thinking about the conduct of war. And it really transformed in the 19th century. And it has a lot to do with industrialization because industrialization changed the, the scale of war. And it also coincided with vastly increased standing armies who were better armed and much more lethal. And it also uh, was a time of nationalism and conscription. So where in, pre-industrial Europe and other areas of the world, quite a lot of soldiers would have been mercenaries, in other words, just paid to fight. And therefore, there wasn't necessarily so much of a sense of duty to them if they died. From the 1800s onwards, you had vastly increased armies who were fighting and being paid, but they were being selected by, by a conscription, and they were being told that their service was a part of their national duty and it coincides with the modern concept of nationalism because nationalism is an astonishingly modern concept you can't have nationalism without mass communication for example how is it that you know in say 1100 AD someone who lives in Cornwall could have any sense of what someone who lives in Northumbria would think so English nationalism just couldn't be feasible under those circumstances I think Napoleon is probably the best example of the first a ruler to take full advantage of nationalism to develop an enormous standing army that was incredibly well equipped uh, and capable of extraordinary feats and doing so in the name of the honor of the of France not just for money so it's an incredibly modern phenomenon and it changes the respect that was considered for the soldiers who were then all of a sudden people with names people worthy of respect uh, from their governments who were to put them to death. Um, there was also an increased sensitivity to not only the combatants, but the civilians that would be caught up in the wars as they were happening. And a Swiss man called Henri Dunant uh, was a, a witness to the Battle of uh, Solferino. And this was a battle between uh, Italian and French forces against Austrian forces in the in the 1850s. And he saw the appalling destruction that it wrought on the local community. He also noticed that the community just had no clue in the chaos of war what they should be doing. How should they engage with these soldiers? How should they help with people that are uh, injured? And so what he did is that he created the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, which has as its symbol the inverted Swiss flag because as a, as a Swiss citizen, he wanted to have that symbol prominent. Um, and so that was founded in 1863 and of course still does a lot of work these days in partnership with the Red Crescent, uh, which represents um, the, the Muslim world. Um, it, coinc it's, it coincided with movement towards a greater codification of the laws of war, which happened uh, quite substantially with the first Geneva Convention of 1864, which dealt with all sorts of matters to do with treatment of the wounded, treatment of prisoners of war, uh, the whether or not there could be targeting of military hospitals and various other things. We all of a sudden have a sense of not only what is a just war, but also what a war crime 
constitutes, um, which is a, a truly uh, sort of substantial conceptual leap forward in, in humanity, I would say. And so these days we now have LOAC, which is the laws of armed conflict, uh, which are distributed to British soldiers, so they have to learn them and, and be aware of them. And there are rules of engagement so that if soldiers are, are engaged in an operation, they will be very clearly described what they can and cannot do under the mandate that they have. More recent mandates, of course, would include United Nations resolutions. Perhaps a notable example is the Iraq war in 2003, where there were question marks as to whether or not it was a legal or illegal conflict. Uh, the US government and eventually the British government uh, defended their rights to intervene under the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1441, which was one in a long line of resolutions against the Saddam Hussein government. Um, the British government, of course, famously pursued a, another resolution to fully uh, legitimise warfare, but the US government felt from the very beginning that that was unnecessary. And this raised a sort of complex legal argument as to whether or not the Iraq war was in fact lawful or not. Um, another sort of justification for war in Iraq was what's known as the R2P doctrine or responsibility to protect. And this is within the United Nations Charter and it states that other members of the United Nations have a responsibility to protect the individuals that are uh, treated brutally by their own governments. And the R2P doctrine had been utilised, for example, uh, in Sarajevo, in former Yugoslavia, in what is now Bosnia. Uh, it was utilised in Kosovo and it was utilised in Sierra Leone. Uh, so when it came to the Iraq war in the early 21st century, the sense was that there is a legal basis for it. But of course, many people disagreed with that. But the fact that we even debate as to whether or not the war was lawful is an astonishing uh, change in human civilization. There would have been no such debates about 100 or so years ago. So it is an amazing change that's happened pretty fast and pretty recently. OK, um, so we also therefore have this notion of war crimes so that people who who murder for their governments may actually murder inappropriately and do so uh, in a way that constitutes a war crime. Uh, you may be aware of the Bloody Sunday uh, killings that happened in January 1972 when um, British paratroopers in Derry, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, opened fire on on protesters, uh, killing 13 of them. There have been a long series of inquiries. There's, there was the Widgery inquiry shortly after the after the killings, uh, which concluded that the killings were lawful. But then more recently, there was the Savile inquiry, which went into a lot more detail and concluded that they were unlawful killings, uh, for which the British government formally acknowledged and apologised in 2010. So. There is, again, a, a lot of debate, a lot of contestation about the concept of a lawful or unlawful killing in wartime. Uh, within, with the case of Bloody Sunday, the, the issue was around the rules of engagement. The paratroopers basically engaged without sufficient threat and they, in short, they shot first. Uh, and that is one of the key reasons why it was considered an unlawful killing. Um, a more recent and gruesome case is that of Eddie Gallagher, who was a US Navy SEAL uh, operating against ISIS in Iraq. And he uh, was accused, and there was an awful lot of evidence to suggest that he, had, he was rightfully accused, um, of murdering a 17-year-old injured ISIS fighter. Now, there are lots of codified aspects of, of uh, uh, laws of war, which state that the wounded have to be treated uh, and not killed, and that prisoners of war similarly cannot be killed. Gallagher um, stabbed the 17-year-old to death and then posed with the body to take photos with it. Um, that's what's alleged to have happened. There was, uh, there was an investigation, there were lots of members of his own SEAL team that testified against him publicly. Um, su suggesting that he was a war criminal. Um, but he was pardoned by President Trump um, because his story became a bit of a 
aspect of the US culture wars with this notion that he was this sort of great hero, he was a sort of a warrior, and this is what warriors do, versus those that felt that you can only legitimately use violence if it is legitimate, if people respect that the violence has a purpose and is not done for the sake of cruelty, but it's done for a specific purpose that is that is sanctioned by law. OK, um, so what about um, police and security services? So in the UK, we have um, police forces, but they are relatively unusual. Most police in Britain are armed without firearms. So they have batons, they may have CS spray, they may have handcuffs and various other sort of accoutrements, but they don't have firearms as a standard issue. Um, but there are armed police. So the question then is, well, how are those armed police uh, sanctioned to, to murder? And what happens if they kill someone? Well, it's probably best uh, to look at some case studies. So one particular case study is the killing of Mark Duggan in 2011, which triggered the English riots that you may remember. So uh, you're probably too young to remember them, but um, there were riots that kicked off in London and then spread to other English cities. Mark Duggan was identified by uh, A10, which was the armed police unit of the Metropolitan Police, uh, of being a member of a North London gang, and that he and an associate were going to be exchanging weapons, uh, guns specifically. And so uh, A10 and Operation Trident, which was a gang related unit within the Metropolitan Police, had been surveilling Duggan uh, and they had been gathering evidence. When they went to try and prevent the handover of the weapons, um, Mark Duggan was shot dead by an officer uh, assuming a threat to his life. This, this death led to um, the riots, as many uh, felt that it was an, uh, an unjustified killing. Um, and it raised all sorts of questions as to whether or not the, the tactical team of the Metropolitan Police had acted lawfully or not. The specific laws that govern the use, to, use of firearms by the British police are, are many and varied, and it's quite complicated, but they include the Firearms Act of 1968, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984, and the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act of 2005. And this particular case is an example of where the courts absolutely did have jurisdiction, because there was an inquest, a formal inquest, headed by a judge, uh, and a jury that had to consider the evidence to work out whether or not Duggan had been lawfully or unlawfully killed. And they finally came to a conclusion that he had been lawfully killed. Nonetheless, the consequences of the death were, were very severe, not least, of course, for Duggan himself. Um, a much more recent and probably more familiar case to you, of course, was the appalling death of George Floyd in, in Minnesota. Uh, that was instrumental in uh, the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement. And again, this raised all sorts of questions about the legality of police murder. Uh, the Minnesota statutes that govern the use of firearms by its officers is, uh, is here. Um, and it states, here's one of the relevant sections. It is the intent of the legislature that peace officers so that's what police are called in, in that state, use deadly force only when necessary in defense of human life or to prevent great bodily harm. In determining whether deadly force is necessary, officers shall evaluate each situation in light of the particular circumstances of each case. So that was what Derek Chauvin, the, the police officer that did the killing, uh, claimed was the defense, that it was, that he, it was um, in self-defense, it was necessary to kill George Floyd, specifically because uh, Chauvin assumed that he was under the influence of drugs and was therefore dangerous. Um, of course, as you're no doubt aware, the jury disagreed with that and convicted him of second degree murder. So that was not a legitimate killing, that was just a murder. So what about the security services? So in the British context, that would include um, MI5, as it's sometimes known, uh, SIS, which is a Security and Intelligence Services, or MI6, and GCHQ, or the Government Communications head Headquarters. They uh, have many of the same powers that the police have. So, for example, MI5 often collaborate with the police because they tend to do internal security matters. So if the police have certain firearms powers, then MI5 will often have 
the same powers or they will utilize the police in order to perform particular tasks on their behalf. Um, SIS, as in MI6, the, the uh, intelligence service that works overseas, has to be authorized by the Secretary of State and they have, again, black letter law which describes their powers and it's the Intelligence Services Act of 1994, Section 7. So this is where the license to kill this is where James Bond would get his license to kill from. So authorization of acts outside the British Islands. If apart from this section, a person would be liable in the United Kingdom for any act done outside the British Islands, he shall not be liable if the act is one which is authorized to be done by virtue of an authorization given by the Secretary of State under this section. OK, and it goes on in, in very detail. Sorry, goes on in detail to describe some of the authorization criteria. The Secretary of State in this instance would be the Foreign Secretary. Um, the Foreign Secretary has oversight of SIS and would have to set out the rules of engagement. Now, according to Sir Richard Dearlove, who was the former head of SIS, which uh, means that he had the code name C from the James Bond films, yeah, you might think that M is the head of SIS, but actually the real head of SIS is codenamed C. Anyway, so Richard Dearlove, who has an amazing spy name, by the way, um, claimed that as far as he was aware, no one was assassinated using Section 7 of the, uh, of the ISA while he was in charge. Sounds a bit vague, but, you know, as far as he's aware, no one was killed. Great. OK. Um, but it's also been pointed out that really having that license is kind of pointless because uh, if you're caught in a conflict zone, let's say, for example, we've got we've in all likelihood had SIS operatives in Syria and Iraq recently. If they get caught, it's not likely that the people that catch them are going to say, oh, well, it's OK because the foreign secretary has given you license to kill. So you're right. Off you go home. No, you're 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 screwed. You're going to be subject to the domestic procedures. Um, so really having a license to kill overseas is kind of pointless anyway. Um, it's just whether or not you'd be liable on return to the UK for the acts that you've committed. So in short, there kind of is a license to kill in British law, but also it's sort of redundant. Um, so as jazzy as it might seem in James Bond films to say that uh, he has a license to kill who, whomever he likes, that's <laughs> not really how it works. Um, before we sort of get to having a discussion, what about murdering the innocent? Now, this is a particularly sort of grim consideration. Um, but there is a specific scenario where the innocent may have to be killed. Uh, and this can be if, for example, an air aircraft is hijacked. Uh, Tony Blair, when he was prime minister, received a phone call that was particularly difficult when a an aircraft was refusing to acknowledge air traffic control uh, and was going away from its identified path. And so Tony Blair had to order it to be trailed by fighter jets and was on the was you know in line to basically order it to be shot down so where does a prime minister get that power from the power to shoot down an aircraft that may be hijacked this of course was in the aftermath of 9 11 and there was a great fear that more aircraft would be used as missiles in that way well interestingly the authorization comes again from international law um, and from domestic law, but domestic law again from the prerogatives of the Crown. So the Prime Minister of the UK has prerogative rights uh, to conduct wars and for internal security, which have been gifted from the Queen to the to the British Cabinet. But anyway, in international law, it states that uh, in Article 9, each contracting state may, um, for reasons of military necessity or public safety, restrict or prohibit uniformly the aircraft of other states from flying over certain areas of its territory. Blah, blah. It's all slightly euphemistic, but it basically means that you can shoot down an aircraft. There was a fascinating case in Germany, the German Federal Constitutional Court, which is the highest court uh, for constitutional matters in Germany, uh, ruled that a blanket policy of shooting down a hijacked aircraft was unconstitutional in Germany. And they did so on the basis of, of German uh, philosophy, German Kantian philosophy, as in coming from Immanuel Kant, uh, which states that you can't de denigrate someone's dignity and you can't use them for another purpose. What they meant by that was that if you shoot down an aircraft full of passengers in order to save supposedly more people on the ground, you're using the people in the aircraft 
as a means to save people on the ground. You're therefore denigrating their, their fundamental human dignity. In Britain and America, where we are much more steeped in a sort of consequentialist logic, that approach doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They would tend to think, well, if you're going to kill X people in the air and save five X people on the ground, you kill X people in the air. That would tend to be their sort of the calculus that would happen in an Anglo-Saxon country. But in Germany, they didn't see it that way, interestingly. And so they came up with a very different sort of way of thinking about it, which is, uh, is fascinating. OK. Um, and finally, conclusion. So how can law allow for the deliberate infliction of harm? So as I started with, this is a really fascinating topic because it forces us to confront what laws are for. It forces us to confront the concept of a state and a government and what it's here to do. Is a government basically here to secure us and to make sure that our interests and our, and our bodily integrity is maintained? Or are states something a little bit more to know empowering than that uh, or do they in fact have to do both um, and do we often through sort of luxury and privilege forget some of the grim necessities of state sanctioned murder um, and what does it mean for a law to cause harm what sort of philosophical underpinning does that have in countries like Germany having a law that deliberately kills individuals faces up with all sorts of philosophical problems about about ethics and morality that in the German tradition are difficult to reconcile with the notion that you should never kill under any circumstances, even if you could save somebody's life by killing. In other contexts like the UK, where we perhaps have a more uh, sort of uh, ingrained consequentialist and utilitarian philosophy, the notion that if you kill some person to save others, you should kill them. But it's not easy to work these things out. And I certainly don't envy the people that have to make these awful decisions uh, on our behalf. But I'd really love to know what you think. So please let me know.